Backprop process is quite complicated. There are four major components, and within each of those components, you will implement both layers. And within each of the layers, for most of them, you will do the weight matrix and bias factor. Here is the outline of the steps. Let's visit the cheat sheet. Backprop, four steps, the matrix notation, the meanings, the Python implementation are clearly written underneath in this cheat sheet. I have zoomed in to the first step. The first step involves the error propagation. The error propagation of the output layer is fairly simple, but the error propagation of the hidden layer is a little more complicated. It involves two step. The reason we do it two step is to avoid the code being too long and too complex so that the process is easier to understand. So here are the steps involved in the first component. The first step is the error propagation of the output layer. If we take a perspective of a training example and one unit L of the output layer, the error is simply the activated value of the particular unit in the output layer subtracted by the Y value of the one hat encoded format. If you remember in the logistic regression as well as Adeline model, the error is calculated with the Y value first subtracted by the activated value. This time we are reversing the order of them so that we can eliminate the minus term in the gradient function. So this is a trick that we're using. In matrix notation, output layer error propagation is a matrix that has dimension n by t. Remember, for the output layer, the number of columns is the number of output unit, t. t equals 2 in this case. It's calculated by differencing the activated value of the output layer, which has the same dimension, by the training set of the y after one hot encoded. The Python implementation is straightforward. You simply subtract activated value of the output layer by the Y training set. Now let's implement that in Python. Error propagation of the output layer is calculated by subtracting the Y training one encoded from the activated value of output layer. This is calculated by using the forward prop previously. Let's run this and print out a few values. For the output layer, there are only two columns. Make sure the values match. The next step of this component will be the error propagation of the hidden layer. It involves two steps. The first step is to calculate this part. This is taking the derivative of the activated value of one of the hidden unit with respect to the net input value of that hidden unit. The linear algebra behind this will tell you that this partial derivative should be calculated by using element-wise multiplication between the activated value of the hidden unit and 1 minus that activated value. In matrix notation, calculate the partial derivative of the activated value of the hidden layer with respect to the input value of the hidden layer. The result will be element-wise multiply the activated value of hidden layer and 1 minus the activated value. Python implementation is straightforward. It will produce a matrix that has dimension n by d. Element-wise multiplication is very convenient with Python multiplication. AH is the activated value of the hidden layer. Activated value, which is right here. So that's the first thing to calculate. We use the activation derivative, the initial letters act deriv of the hidden layer to record this variable. In Python, here is how to implement the act deriv element-wise multiplication between activated value of the hidden layer and 1 minus the activated values. Let's run this, print a few values here, 
now we have five columns already because this matrix has D number of columns and D is greater than five. So we got five. Make sure the values match your version. Now the second step of error propagation of the hidden layer is to calculate the error prop. Once we have that complex term, the partial derivative term, it's more straightforward to calculate the error propagation of the hidden layer. It is multiplication of three parts. We have the error of the output layer, multiply that by the transposed weight matrix of the output layer to backtrack the error responsibilities for the hidden layer, and then element-wise multiply with the partial derivative that we just calculated. It looks quite formidable, but in Python implementation, it's relatively easy. Keep in mind that the dimension of the error propagation in the hidden layer is the same as the net input matrix of the hidden layer or the activated value of the hidden layer, which is n by d. How do we get this? The error propagation of the output layer is n by t. The weight matrix w out has dimension d by t. After transpose, you have t by d. The multiplication between these two matrices produce a matrix which is n by d. And since the activation derivative is also n by d, we use element-wise multiplication. It will multiply elements on the same index, will produce a matrix that has the same dimension, n by d. Python implementation, by using a dot multiplication to multiply the first two parts and then use element-wise multiplication times the act derivative part. In Python, by using the error of the output layer, dot multiply the transpose value of the weight matrix of the output layer, element-wise multiply act derivative that we just calculated, we have a matrix of dimension n by d. Look at a few values. Make sure you get the same values as I do. Now let's move on to the second component. In the cheat sheet, the second component will calculate the gradient. Beginning with this step, with the component 2, 3, and 4, you have four steps. Two steps correspond to the output layer, and two steps correspond to the hidden layer. Remember, we are back prop, so we go from output layer back to the hidden layer. So output layer goes first. Within each layer, you have two things, the weight matrix and the bias vector. So these three steps follow the same kind of flow. Now let's take a closer look at the second component. It's here. In the output layer, to calculate the gradient for the weight matrix, we adapt the same formula from logistic regression. Gradient is the partial derivative of the cost function with respect to the weight that you are trying to optimize. The gradient is calculated as transpose value of the input, which is the activated value of the hidden layer, multiplied by the error matrix of the output layer. This is very similar to the formula that we use in logistic regression. The only difference is that we lose the minus sign because we calculated error the opposite way so that we can cancel out the minus term. For the weight matrix of the output layer has the same dimension as the weight matrix of the output layer, d by t. So you take the activated value of the hidden layer, which has dimension n by d, transpose that, you have d by n, multiplied by the error matrix n by t, the result is d by t. Python implementation, fairly straightforward. You use a dot function to multiply the two matrices Make sure that you remember to include the transpose part. I will talk about the bias first before I go back to Python implementation. For the bias factor of the output layer, it's similar. The only difference is that you use a one vector, a vector of one that it has a length of n, instead of using the activated value coming from the hidden layer because the data associated with bias is always one. It's similar to the intercept term of regression. By transposing that column vector of one, you get a row vector of one by n, timed by the same error matrix of the output layer, 
which is m by t, you get a rho vector of 1 by t, which becomes the gradient of the bias vector. Python implementation is slightly different from the gradient for the weight matrix because here we can actually use the numpy sum because this is easier. Keep in mind that we are summing over all the columns. Imagine that we have n rows but t columns, t equal 2 here. So we have n by 2 matrix. We are summing all over the n examples. We are not summing all over the two elements in each row because those are for the two different output unit. So in using the numpy.sum function, we are specifying the x is equal 0. x is equal 0 means to do summation along the first axis, which is the vertical axis. You are calculating the sum of each of the vertical factors, which is the column factors. By the end, you have a row vector of dimension 1 by t. All right, let's go back to Python implementation to implement these two. Gradient of the weight matrix, the transpose value of the activated function of the hidden layer, dot multiply the error of the output layer. Let's run this. And first two rows, the gradient is quite large. That's why the learning rate needs to be very small. Bias factor, to implement the gradient of the bias vector, we use a numpy.sum, specify x is, is 0. And also be careful that we explicitly reshape the vector to be a row vector instead of shapeless vector, because we want to make sure that the broadcast is broadcast across the rows and make sure the columns remain consistent. Let's run this, print a few numbers, make sure you get the same. It's a vector, it only has two elements because it's the gradient for the bias factor of the output layer. There are only two output units, so there are only two output layer bias. Here, you might be wondering why do I use a minus one for the dimension? Now, this is a trick of the NumPy reshape. Whenever you say minus one, you are asking NumPy to calculate what the correct number should be, as long as the question that you ask NumPy to do is solvable. Here, because this is a vector, if I specify there is one row, there must be a certain fixed number of columns that NumPy can figure out. This math is solvable by NumPy, so it won't produce any error. However, imagine that if you change this to minus one, NumPy will not be able to solve this problem, so it will give you an error. Use this trick often because it's very convenient. You didn't have to keep everything in your mind to calculate the correct number here. You can simply ask NumPy, but make sure that you provide enough information in the other dimensions so that NumPy can calculate the correct number. So this cell is not relevant. Okay, next we will move to the gradient of the hidden layer. Let's look at the cheat sheet. It should be quite similar here, similar to the first part. The only difference is that we are getting gradient matrices of different dimensions because it's now for the hidden layer. The gradient is calculated by multiplying the transposed input matrix with the error propagation of the hidden layer. This part is the matrix that you calculated earlier by using the two-step error propagation. So this part has the correct responsibility of the hidden layer weights so that it can get properly adjusted to reduce the error. In Python, implementation is quite straightforward. Transpose and then use dot method to multiply with the error of the hidden layer. In the end, you will get the gradient weight matrix for the hidden layer of size m by d, because the weight matrix of the hidden layer has a dimension of m by d. For the bias, it's the same trick we will use numpy the sum along the axis of zero and make sure that you reshape to be a row vector. Let's take a look at the Python implementation. For the weight matrix, gradient descent of the weight matrix for the hidden layer. Now the input is the actual input data. Error propagation of the hidden layer. Run this and take a look at the values. Make sure you get those values. 
With hidden layer, you have more columns. So slicing to five will give me five values. For the bias vector, using numpy to sum, using error propagation as a hidden layer, sum along the axis of zero, make sure you reshape and take a look at the values. The gradient of the bias vector, I will only see one row and up to five values. That's it. One thing you might notice is that the gradient of the hidden layer is much smaller than the gradient of the output layer. That is because the output layer is closer to the actual Y values. So it absorbs all the errors as compared to the training set. As you propagate the error through the output layer into the hidden layer, the hidden layer gets assigned certain part of the error responsibility and the gradient is further reduced after the calculation. This relates to the famous problem of vanishing gradient that other professors talk about. Now let's move on to the next component to calculate the weight updates for the output and the hidden layer. The third component is here. It's rather straightforward. By doing the output layer first and hidden layer second, in each layer, we will calculate the weight update for the weight matrix and then for the bias factor. If you remember from previous demos, logistic regression, the weight update, delta weight, is calculated by the minus sign multiplied by eta, the learning rate, multiplied by the gradient. Python implementation of this is very straightforward because eta is a scalar. The dimension will remain the same as the gradient. These arrows indicate that these two things are the same. We are using the result of the previous step here. The minus sign times eta times the gradient of the weight matrix for the output layer is calculated here. So it will produce a matrix of dimension d by t because this is for the output layer. For the bias, again, the formula is the same, minus eta times the gradient for the bias vector of the output layer. Dimension is 1 by t, it's this item. Dimension will remain, Python implementation is straightforward. Let's implement that. For the weight matrix of the output layer, delta w output layer, the weight update, minus eta times the gradient of the weight matrix for the output layer. There will only be two columns, two rows and two columns, make sure you get the same values. For the bias vector, here is the code, minus eta times the gradient of the bias for the output gets the delta weight update for the bias of the output layer. And there will be only two items printed. So these are the weight update. Let's look at the weight update for the hidden layer. The logic will be very similar using the same formula, simply changing the correct gradient matrix for the hidden layer. We are getting a matrix of dimension M by D. The gradient of the weight matrix for the hidden layer is from here and very similar for the bias vector weight update. So let's look at the Python implementation for the weight matrix minus eta times gradient of the weight for the hidden layer. Print two rows now. The weight update is very small because this is in the hidden layer. For the bias vector, minus eta times gradient for the bias factor of the hidden layer gets the weight update for the bias factor in the hidden layer. We will have five numbers. Make sure the numbers match. They are also very small because it's in a hidden layer. Now, finally, we will implement the component four, update the weights. This is the most straightforward component of the backprop. The cheat sheet, update the weight is by using the original weight and the weight update. This time, because we have so many weight and bias matrices and factors, I will no longer create the old and new version. We will simply update them on the spot. Updating things on the spot can use a Python trick. This simply makes the line of code shorter, but make sure that you understand the operand. 
plus equal. Whenever you use plus equal or minus equal, times equal or divide equal, later we'll use a divide equal in another video. Plus equal means the left hand equal the left hand plus the right hand. So W output layer equal W output layer plus delta for the W output layer. It's simply adding the right hand side onto the left hand side and replace the original left hand side. I hope this is straightforward. The dimension of these two will be the same as the weight update, which will be the same as the gradient. It's D by T because it's output layer. For the bias vector, it will be 1 by T. And very similar, weight matrix of the hidden layer plus equal the delta weight matrix of the hidden layer. It adds a weight update onto itself and update the weight matrix. Same thing for the bias vector. We will implement these all together in Python. So here are the codes to update the weight matrix for the output layer. W weight plus equal delta W weight. Print a few rows. Compare the values for yourself. Update the weight of the bias vector. Compare the values. Now the weights are much larger than the initial values, which is very close to zero. Now it's almost close to one or minus one. The bias values are even larger. Update the weights of the hidden layer. And the bias vector of the hidden layer gets updated. Again, observe that the updated weights in the hidden layer are much smaller than the output layer. Although it's larger than the initial values, it's still very close to zero. They get updated at a very smaller scale. Different from forward prop, we will not convert all of these steps into one function for the backward prop because we will not need to run these again once we put together the for loop. Next, after all the weights have been updated for one turn, we will calculate the cost after training one epoch. Let's review the cheat sheet. Calculating the cost involves three steps. We need to conduct a forward prop by using the updated weights. This forward prop will produce results that are different from the forward prop earlier because the earlier forward prop was based on the initial weights. And now this forward prop will produce something that is closer to the target, even if only after one epoch of training. After calculating the forward prop, we will get the activated value of the output layer and those will be very similar to the predicted likelihood of the class labels. We will use those to select the higher predicted likelihood of each training example and make a prediction. After that, we can calculate the cost. Briefly review the cost value calculation. After getting the activated value of the output layer by using the forward prop, here is the cross entropy formula for calculating some of the total log likelihood of the predictions, which is a cost function that we are trying to minimize. The Python implementation is quite similar from previously. The cost function is quite similar to the logistic regression, but the only difference is that we have matrices instead of vectors for the Z. So by using the numpy to sum, it not only sum all over the rows, but also sums all over the columns, as indicated here. Summing all over the T columns means to sum the likelihood of all the output units, because all of the output units have to predict correctly. And summing all of the rows is to sum all over N training examples. This is a long line of code. That's why I use a line break here to tell Python that consider the next row of code. They should be in the same row. After that, we will get a scalar result, which is cost. We will append the cost in the list and later we will make a graph of the learning curve. Let's look at the Python implementation. We will first do the forward prop. Here is a code. Perform the forward prop by using the function get the activated output layer, program this long line of code to calculate cost. It's the cross entropy. Let's run this, print out the first updated cost. Make sure that you get the same. 
It's a very large cost, but it will improve after running several epoches. Then we will append cost value into the cost values list. Now the cost process is done. Next, we will calculate accuracy. Let's review the cheat sheet. To calculate accuracy, we need to first make classification by using the activate value of the output layer. By using those predicted Y values, we will compare them with the ground truth labels of those examples in the Y training data and calculate the accuracy score, then append the accuracy score to the list. One step that requires additional work here is to calculate a flag variable for the Y train. In preparing the data, we only converted the target variable into one hat encoded, which is a matrix, not a flag column. But now, because result of the classification is a one dimensional vector, to be able to use the accuracy score function, we need to also provide the ground truth labels of the target variables in 1D column format. We don't have it yet. So we need to produce this in this step. First, let's make classifications by using the activated value calculated from above. So here I'm using the argument max with axis one to indicate which index of the column of each row has the highest activate value that will flag the corresponding index as a predicted Y value. So in the end, I will get a vector of sides N. Print the first five values. What does these five zeros mean? So essentially, I got a vector of size n with the predicted labels of all the training examples. In fact, what I got is not exactly the predicted labels. It's simply the column index of each of the row in the active value matrix. And these index values indicate for that particular row of the active value, which column has the highest active value. Since we only have two output units, there are only two columns here. So this zero basically means that for the first training example, the label that has the position zero or index zero in the columns is the predicted label. Index position zero of the target labels corresponds exactly to the label zero. So for the first five rows, the model is predicting the label to be all zero, which means no default. Let's take a closer look. Let's take a look at the first five rows of the activate value of the output layer. So these are the first five rows. The predicted likelihood of these rows having the first label, the target label that has index zero, which is the first column, is overwhelmingly larger than the predicted likelihood of the target label with index one, which is the second column. So that's why the predicted label are all zero column position. And zero column position coincidentally correspond to the label zero. And this is not coincidence. This is by design the case. Based on these, let's use argmax again. To fire the first row, we should get a zero value as a zero index position for the classified label. All right? I hope you understand what this does then and what these mean. So now, in order to use the accuracy score function, we also need to prepare the 1D target column. In creating the 1D target column, use the original target column and do a comparison to make a flag variable. It's critical to know which label to compare. You should compare with the label that has index one in the output layer units. Remember earlier that we arranged the first column of the Y train data in one hot encoded format to have the label zero. And the second column has index one. That's why we need to create a flag variable that flags the value with column index one, which is label one now. That's why I'm using these codes to create that flag variable. Let's run this. 
Now we are ready to calculate the accuracy. Use the accuracy score imparted earlier, providing the ground truth, which is the flag variable for the training set we just created. And we provide the predicted labels and we get the accuracy score. And let's print that. It's only 78%. It's far from good enough. So we will keep training. Finally, we save this accuracy into the list so that we can see the learning curve. With the accuracy score calculated and saved to the list, this completes the full process inside a for loop of the epoch. Now with all of these codes for the process ready, you are now ready to put them together into a complete for loop and train the model. So that means we will restart we will put them all together in one giant cell with the for loop, including the codes that are used to implement the forward and backward propagation, as well as calculating the performance. So let's do that. We will first copy the codes for the initialization because we will start from fresh. So here it is, the layout of the neural network model again. Here is initialization codes. I basically copied the same code, but I made only the change in the number of epochs because now we will train them instead of doing the one loop. Let's run this. We got the same initial values as before. You can compare them. They are the same. For safety, I also copy the codes that are used to create the Y flag variable used to calculate the accuracy just in case that next time when you start over, you can start from reinitialization without having to run all the detailed steps of the forward and backward prop. Now let's put the for loop together. So let's take a look for underscore in range epoch. It will create a series of size epoch. Now epoch is a thousand. We will run for a thousand epochs. The underscore means that I do not need to know this round number. Inside that, it simply copies the code exactly from the forward and back prop. For the forward prop, we're using the convenient function here. We'll calculate the activated value of the hidden and output layers because we need to use those. We need to use active value of the hidden and activated value of the output to calculate necessary components of the back prop. Backprop has four components. Under each component, there are two subcomponents. There are two steps under 1.2. After these, we will calculate the costs. We will use the same code. Do the forward prop again, this time with updated weight and bias vectors. Calculate the cost, append the cost. Calculate predicted labels. Calculate accuracy and save the accuracy. One thing I added here, which is different from the previous demo video, is I calculate the time used to train this model for a thousand epochs. Let's see how long it takes. You can take a closer look at the codes. If you have any questions, let me know. I can explain those to you. So let's run this. Finished. It took 10 seconds. Let's print out the current weight matrix of the output layer. It should be a small matrix with seven by two dimension, seven rows, two columns. You should be able to get the exact same values. Take a look and compare the values. The weight matrices after training a thousand epochs, weight matrices are not very large, which means there may not be too much of the overfitting in the model, but we will take a closer look. To evaluate the performances of the model on training and test set, here is the codes. For training set, we have complete history of the training iterations, both the cost and accuracy values. Let's take a look at the current cost and accuracy. The cost is 2,700 something, much smaller than the over 10,000 cost value after only one iteration that we observed earlier. Current accuracy is 0.92, it's very good. To tell you the truth, the best performance that you can possibly get is probably 93%. So this 92% accuracy value is quite good. 
Now, here is something that's interesting. We can take a look at the learning history over the 1,000 epochs. Here, I'm making two plots. I will make the cost value line plot on the left, and I will make a plot of accuracy score on the right. So you can expect to see a plot with two subplots. You will see a dropping line on the left and an increasing line on the right because the cost is on the left-hand side, something to be minimized, and the accuracy is on the right, something to be maximized. Let's run this. Overall, you see the cost values drop as the training goes on, whereas the accuracy goes up as the training goes on. But you see something very curious. There are these spikes, you know, worsening cases, only a few epochs along the way, and it quickly gets corrected. And whenever the cost reversed the trend for a few epochs, the accuracy also went back. So what does this mean? Because the cost function is very complex with many, many coefficients, as you can imagine, the weight matrices are quite large, and there are two layers here, one hidden layer and one alpha layer involving complex weight matrices. The cost function terrain is hard to navigate. Gradient descent sometimes can traverse back and overshoot the target, leading to a worse update. However, the gradient descent mechanism is robust, so only after a few corrections it will come back to the track. However, these are still annoying. Can we eliminate those? Yes, we can do that. By implementing the mini-batch gradient descent, we can almost get rid of all of these huge reversing incidences. We will implement that in the next few videos. You may wonder if there's overfitting of the model on the training set. Let's examine the accuracy of the model on the test set. So here I'm conducting another forward prop with the test set of the input variables. Calculate the activated values of the output layer. Go through the argmax to make prediction. And then calculate that by using the predicted values for the test set examples, as well as the flag variable of the target. Very nice. The test set accuracy is almost the same as the train set accuracy. And because the best model that you can achieve is not far away, it should be 93%. So there is not very much overfitting. Although I will tell you there is some overfitting. You will see that very clearly in the next few videos. All right, so this concludes this video the basic implementation of the multi-layer perceptron model involving three layers, the input hidden and the output layer, the processes inside one loop of the epoch, all the processes together in the for loop and train the model for a thousand epochs. We calculate model learning curves. We didn't find too much overfitting, although there is overfitting which will be demonstrated in the next few videos. And last but not least, we have these backtracks of the cost and the accuracy, and we will see how we can get rid of these by implementing mini-batch gradient descent in the next few videos. I hope you enjoyed this video. See you next time.